Good morning. Today is July the 5th, 2020. And welcome to this online presentation of my sermon for this holiday weekend. I'm reading from 1 Peter <clears throat> for the sermon this morning uh, from the second chapter and beginning with the ninth verse. So I thought it was a, an appropriate passage for us to look at as we consider what it means to be celebrating our democracy, celebrating this great nation in which we live. Peter writes to the Christians, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God, who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. That ends the reading. You people, says the author of 1 Peter, a chosen race, a chosen race, uh, a holy nation, um, a royal priesthood. What on earth is the author of 1 Peter trying to say? in this simple little letter in the New Testament. What is he suggesting when he defines the new converts of Christianity to whom he's writing these words? Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation. Let's think about that passage for just a few moments today. This weekend, has been a time of celebration in the United States as we celebrate our 244th birthday as a nation. We North Americans spent millions of dollars this past week on fireworks to celebrate this historic accomplishment. A 244-year-old democracy is quite, quite an accomplishment. Historians and political scientists tell us that Democracy always hangs in a precious and precarious balance, and it is highly dependent upon its citizenship to take our roles in this historic experiment seriously. So this morning, I want you to think with me a moment about what we mean when we speak of a Christian nation. What we mean when we say we are citizens of the United States of America, and to reflect on the possibility that the Bible really does have something to say about this to, uh, uh, on, to us on this subject. I'm convinced that it does. You know, you may have noticed over the years, I have, in all of the churches that I have served over my 50 years of parish ministry almost, in fact, I think in all of those churches, they've had two flags in the front of their sanctuary. One, of course, is always the flag of the United States of America. And the other flag is the flag that denotes our faith in Jesus Christ. We refer to it as the Christian flag. North American churches are somewhat unique in our displaying of the flag in our places of worship. You most likely would not find flags in the cathedrals of Europe or in the holy shrines of the Middle East where three major world religions were born. But here in America, we have our flags and they do provide for us a significant symbolism. The two flags in the sanctuary that we have are to remind us of the admonition of Jesus who called upon his followers to be in the world, but not of the world. The two flags represent two loyalties that each of us as Christian citizens feel in the living out of our lives. And those two loyalties 
must coexist. We do not leave our American citizenship at the doorstep when we come into the worship setting every Sunday morning. In the same way, when we go back out into the world to live our lives and make decisions day by day, we don't live, leave our Christian faith back in the sanctuary. There is, I think, a very real sense that we live in the midst of this dialectic, this tension between these two significant loyalties in our lives to our country and to our faith tradition. It's very significant, therefore, that both flags are represented in our places of worship. But I think it's also this dialectic that must call us to some serious reflection on what it means to be a faithful people. What does it mean to be a Christian nation? There are those who like to refer to our country as a Christian nation, even though we do have a large Jewish population, as well as a number of other religious traditions that coexist within the boundaries of our land. So perhaps a better question would be, what has the Christian tradition taught us about the significance of this citizenship and discipleship dialectic? And to be honest, I think that we would find that what the Christian faith has taught us is not all that different from the teachings of other prominent world religions. One of the books that I remember reading while I was in seminary that had a profound impact on my understanding of my own responsibility as both a Christian and as the citizen of, of, of the world, a citizen of my country, was a book written by German theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the title of his book was Letters from Prison. That book has become a classic in Christian literature. And it is one that I think every person of faith really needs to read, especially now. I'm sure you can check it out at your local library. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, letters from Prison. I ask that you get it and read it. Bonhoeffer was a Christian theologian who had become so disillusioned with the government back in the 1930s in his homeland of Germany, so disillusioned that he sought to overthrow its leaders. The ruling party, prominent in Germany at that time, was the Nazi party. And of course, the Chancellor was Adolf Hitler. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of a small number of clergy who determined that that government was grossly inconsistent with the ideals and the principles of his faith. The leadership of his country was costing millions of innocent people their very lives. And Bonhoeffer believed he had to be stopped this Chancellor of Germany. Dietrich Bonhoeffer ended up facing the death penalty himself as a result of his conspiring to bring an end to the horrific reign of Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Third Reich. Today, there are, I dare say, very few Americans who would argue with the position that Bonhoeffer took in response to the rise of Bonhoeffer's movement of Hitler's movement. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Niemöller were a few of the dissidents who formed in those days the Confessing Church. While they did that, over one-third of all Protestant clergy throughout Germany got on the bandwagon of the Third Reich. Yes, you heard me right. They cheered on Hitler as he stood before throngs of people saying in 1933, this party stands for positive Christianity. Adolf Hitler, this party stands for positive Christianity. And you know what? Hitler had discovered his ally. It was a powerful and articulate majority of Christian clergy and Christian people who stood behind him 
and cheered him on as he publicly asserted that the Christian faith will safeguard the souls of the German people. Hitler worked closely with the Protestant clergy and mobilized what was to be called the German Christian faith movement. The culmination of the identification of Christianity with the cause of Nazi party came in November of 1933, as Hitler was appointed chancellor and a great religious rally was held in Berlin and from it came the slogan that was to be the rallying cry of this new order, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Glob, one people, one government, one faith. We all know the rest of the story of what happened in Germany when the church identified the interest of the gospel with the German nationalism. Gradually, millions of Jews were exterminated at the hands of this most corrupt government that the world has ever known. The gospel seemed to be lost, at least temporarily. The ethic of justice and righteousness of Jesus had been sold out to a commandeering, zealous, nationalism, and the result was atrocity. What happened in Germany in those years of rampant nationalism in sync with a certain brand of Christian extremism, that demonstrates why the founders of our great democracy 244 years ago demanded a sharp separation of church and state. I think it unwise for churches to house partisan political rallies, along with other ways of aligning with specific politicians and candidates. There's a reason for a separation of church and state, my friends. We can proudly display both of these flags in our sanctuary, but I believe it is of crucial importance for each of us as people of God to remember the passage of First Peter and what I hear the scripture saying is that we are, first of all and foremost, people of the covenant. Once you were no people, now you are people. We are descendants of Abraham, and that means three things. Go back and look at the passage again. We, the people of God, as people of faith, are called to understand ourselves with three three identifying marks, and I truly believe our destiny as a community, as a nation, and as a world rests on our understanding this truth. This is so important. Number one, says First Peter, we're a chosen race, but think about it for a moment. The message of the Christian faith has traveled near and far over every, all, every continent on the globe. It's been embraced by people of every color and every tribe imaginable. But, says First Peter, we're one race, the chosen race. It has nothing to do with the color of our skin. It has to do with how we identify ourselves as people of faith in Christ. Can you imagine what really believing that truth could mean in this world today where ethnic conflicts and racism continue to plague us in so many ways? These past few weeks and month or so have just been horrific in the pain that has surfaced. We are, says First Peter, we are, as people of God, a chosen race, one race, chosen for what, you ask? Special privilege? No. Says First Peter, you're chosen to be a royal priesthood. You didn't know you were a priest, did you? But in the sense that you and I, each of us, as part of a community of faith, are called to be engaged in reconciliation. That is, bringing the gap between God and humanity just a little closer. Bridging the gap. And every one of us who does this, that's the role of a priest. There were a kingdom of priests, says the author, First Peter, a holy priesthood. We are called as people of God not to be a special 
privilege, but as God explained to Abraham when he called him to be a light to all of the nations, to demonstrate gracious compassion, to bring people closer to God, to bring to bridge the gap. Can you imagine what would happen in this country if even just we Christians were to take those words seriously? We are a royal priesthood. And thirdly, says the author, First Peter, we're called to be a holy nation. As descendants of Abraham, we're a part of a holy nation, which God promised to Abraham way back in Genesis. A nation not bounded with national borders and walls that people want to create to keep people out. But if you don't believe that borders create hostility, just take a trip down south. It's not safe in those places, and that's unfortunate. Peter is saying in here that our nation is a people with whom we share the faith. Before we are anything, we're people of God. We're a chosen race. We're people of all colors. One race. Royal priesthood. Holy nation. God's own people. So consider this, my friends. You're a part of a race not determined by the color of your skin, a priesthood not determined by your ordination, and a nation not determined by geographical boundaries. This understanding of who we are as that is what the author First Peter is calling for. An Ethic for Life Together. And by the way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote another book with that title, Life Together, based on justice, based on righteousness. It all fits together. There's room for two flags in a sanctuary, for people who have been called to be in the world but not of it. May those symbols constantly remind us that our faith in Jesus Christ gives us a foundation for who we are as a nation. And may we pray together that we may truly be what we've been called to be, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. May it be so. Amen.